Well, hello, coffee time friends. How y'all doing? It's a beautiful day. The sun's shining, skies are blue, no rain. Temperatures are good. Hopefully they will be all day today. I hope you're all having a place today. We're on our series uh, and we're talking about purpose. So uh, we started out with purpose question, purpose abandon. And today, September the 15th, can y'all believe we're in the middle of September? September the 15th, we're on Purpose Restored. And uh, we've got um, three more purposes to go through. We're about halfway through. We get our lessons from Bible Studies for Life. We get ours at Lifeway. You can uh, order them if you want. You don't have to have them. Uh, we don't go by the book exactly. We do highlights. So I'll give you book, chapter, and verse. As long as you've got the Bible, you can look the scriptures up and read them for yourself. Uh, but today's lesson is a good lesson. It's the purpose restored. Isn't it wonderful to restore something that was once in good shape and then has, over time it had faded and things have gone differently and you can restore those things into to new, like cars. Uh, a lot of people restore furniture. I've seen old furniture that was in scrap yards and it was brought back in Makes it be something beautiful you can use in your home and be proud of it. Lots of people restore things that were probably deemed useless or had lost its value. Cars. A lot of people restore old cars. And they are beautiful and they shine probably the same as they did the day they came off the showroom floors, they say. So restoration is a possibility. We see that, don't we? The point today is through Jesus, we can be forgiven and restored to the purpose for which he created us. That's, that sums it up. That sums, we can stop right there and say point made. He, we, through Jesus, we can be restored and go back to the purpose for which we were created. Acts 3, 14 through 26 is the verses. Acts chapter 3, verses 14 through 26. What's something you have owned? that's been refurbished or restored. Something that was in your family. Maybe you have something that um, you had restored, maybe you done it yourself. Paint does fade over time, it says. It cracks, it peels, it changes over time. Life comes in and distorts what's there. Uh, some things you can just restore. You can just put a coat of paint on it, sand it a little bit, and set it over there, and it's beautiful. You can be all original with it. You can say, that piece of furniture used to be varnished, I'm gonna paint it green, and it's beautiful. But when you're talking about artwork, something that is as precious as uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, or a fresco painting on the wall of a, of a temple somewhere, you want to get the very best to do that. You want it to be back to the very original. You don't want any of your thoughts to be put into it. You want only the thoughts and the ideas of the cre original creator. So some things are more precious than others that, that fade over time. Some things are more uh, precise that we want to make sure we're getting just right. We want to make sure we get it just right. It says, we need restoration too. We've lost our way, wandering from God and painted over the abundant life and the purpose God created. Some of us have painted a new coat of paint over what God had already previously painted. For us, with the dull color of self, I like the way the author goes into these little explanations. We've painted over it with the dull color of self and the grime of sin, no DIY effort will do. You can't fix yourself. That's what he's saying here. We need the master's restoration. Some things need to be restored by the master. And our lives and our purpose is one of those things. You can't DIY. You can't get that dull pain of self and grime of sin off. You can't. It's going to take the master's touch. The master's restoration. I love that little analogy right there. 
Acts 3, 14 through 18. But ye denied the Holy One and the, the, and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you. A murderer. Who was the murderer? Barabbas. Who did they release? They released the murderer. And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made his man this man strong, whom ye see and know ye, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of all y'all. In the presence of you all, he says. And now, brethren, I would that thou ignorance, yet ye did it, and did also your rulers. He says, through your ignorance, you did this, and so did your rulers. But those things which God before had show, showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. You killed Jesus. You let a murderer loose. Hopefully this was just through your ignorance, he says, and your ruler's ignorance. But those things which God before had showed through the, and preached all his life what was going to happen, he has so fulfilled, he says. Few people like interruptions. I don't, but I'm trying more and more to see interruptions, those unplanned phone calls or encounters as opportunities. Now, we're not just talking about interrupting while you're speaking. We're talking about your plan, your direction, and you get an interruption. And God uses that interruption to show someone his love, his grace, and his mercy. Someone, through that interruption, gets to know him as their Lord and Savior. We plan our days, but oftentimes the biggest blessings comes in the interruptions, the unplanned areas of our life. God puts those things in our life so we can act and react according to his will and his glory and bring someone closer to him. Can you think of interruptions that have happened in your life? Can you think of interruptions that have happened in your plans? Maybe even your career plans. You had planned to be fill in the blank. And God stepped in and said, over here. Uh, you're going that way. I want you to go this way. Maybe you are something totally different today because of an interruption that happened to you. God is in the works. It says, um, the unplanned phone calls or encounters as opportunities. These are opportunities. That's what the Apostle Peter and John did. In Acts 3, these two followers of Jesus were headed to the temple to pray. They were headed to get a cup of coffee. They were headed to the office. They were headed to their jobs. They were, I'm filling in with what you might be doing. These things are just a normal occurrence. They went to the temple to pray daily. So, they were just headed on their way. This was their schedule, probably talking back and forth. They wasn't planning on this interruption. <clears throat> Prayers is certainly an important and needed practice for all of us. But Peter and John were interrupted. They, they encountered a, a lame beggar. But instead of giving him a few coins, they gave him something better. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What an interruption. What a blessing. What a miracle. What a witness. The man was immediately healed and he was able to do something he had never done before. He, had, he entered with them into the temple, verse 8. He had never been in the temple. He had laid at the gate of the temple. His frailties were a barrier for him, and he couldn't just walk. Now he was walking and leaping and, and experiencing this for the first time. He was well known. The crowds began to gather. Peter began with a question that had obvious answer. To the crowds. Ye men of Israel, why marvel at this? Why are you why are you marveling? 
Why do you think this is something special? That was an obvious question. He had laid there for years. They knew him. They knew he couldn't walk. They knew he was lame. Why? A disabled man who has never walked is leaping around? Yet to Peter's point, this man was healed, not by the two apostles, but by Jesus. Peter then turned his attentions away from the healed man and to the crowd. He had brought Jesus into the conversation, but then said he denied the Holy One and in, in the, in the just and killed the Prince of Life. Started out with some bad news, didn't he? Peter wanted them to understand that they didn't just reject some rabbi. Jesus is the Holy One and the just, in verse 14. This wasn't uh, lost on the, on the crowd. Peter was referring to Jesus as God's Messiah. Here was God's Messiah. The very source of life in their midst, but they rejected him and killed him. He said it straight. He told them like it was. Thankfully, that wasn't the end of the story. God raised Jesus from the dead. This wasn't just a story. This was a reality that they had witnessed. Peter and John stood there as witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. He said, now look, y'all had Jesus. You had the Messiah. You had the eternal life and you killed him. He also pointed out you released a murderer amongst the crowds. You could have had the prince of life and you just done away with him. And John and I here, we are witnesses to that. We've seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he is living. Because Jesus is alive, he is still at work. He works on our behalf as a, pl a place where we place our faith in his name. Now, this isn't just some story about Jesus. This is a story about our Jesus. This is a story about the Jesus we worship today. This is a continual story. We just happen to be in it now. Sometimes we read the Bible like we're reading a storybook or like we're reading something that happened to another group of people. We are that group of people. We just showed up now in 2024. We just showed up in, in this era, this is the same era that we're talking about. It's just a continuance. Because Jesus is alive, he is still at work. He works on our behalf as we place our faith in his name. The name of Jesus isn't some magical word, even for us. Our names represent the holy, uh, the whole of who we are. So to put faith in the name of Jesus is to believe in the trust in Jesus' authority and his power. Because Jesus is alive, putting our faith in him is still as powerful and, tr and transforming as it was for the once crippled man. I'm pausing. I want you to think about that. This is the same Jesus that healed the crippled man. This is the same Jesus that let Moses part the Red Sea. It's the same Jesus you call on today. His powers have not failed. His powers have not waned. His powers are the same powers. He's still working for us to, to uh, bring us closer to him and his purpose. But how much faith does it take? We don't know how much faith or understanding this crippled man had. Maybe he had none. It doesn't even say the crippled man asked for anything except coins. It doesn't say he even mentioned Jesus. But when Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk in verse 6, it was enough for him to take hold of Peter's hand. Mustard seeds are incredibly small. One eighth of an inch in diameter. But Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto the mountains, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew seventeen twenty. 
What a wonderful notion to know and to believe that we serve the same Jesus. And it takes the one-eighth of an inch of mustard seed, that much faith is all he asks us for. Acts 3, 19 through 21. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of, of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and be in, and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of of, of uh, restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Since the world began. Jesus was here before the world began. Jesus is still here. And we're still serving the same one. Peter had led with the bad news first. Do you want bad news? If someone walks up to you and says, I got good news and bad news, which one you want first? The author here says that the person telling the news wants to give the good news first and the bad news last. But the person hearing it wants to hear the bad news and end on a positive note. Is that true for you? I don't really know. I just want to know it all. I'm like, just tell me. I don't want to be waiting. But I want to get the good news and the bad news. I want to hear it both. It says, Peter had led with the bad news first. The bad news was wrapped up in the healing of this crippled man. But there it was. You killed the one who is the source of life. Now that's bad news. Peter now followed with good news. Their past actions were not this end of the story. If they acted upon the next words Peter spoke, repent ye therefore and be convert. Verse 19. So he told them what they did. He gave them the bad news first. Then he followed up and said, repent ye therefore and be converted. Don't just take it uh, as an opinion. No. He says, it's a complete 180 degree change in direction. You're going this way. Be converted and go that way. Peter points to he points to three things God does when when we repent and turn back. He says, "Your sins are blotted out. Blotted out carries the meaning of erased." Ink didn't soak into the first century parchment as ink does in our modern day paper. A wet sponge could erase whatever was on the parchment in the same way we might erase a whiteboard today, it says. So he used that example. And he says, your sins will be blotted out. Seasons of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Jesus doesn't just remove the bad, he replaces it with something good. That was his second point. Seasons of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord, he says. His third point, he will send Jesus who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. We can experience the forgiveness and the refreshment of his presence in our lives, but that is only an inkling of what's to come when Jesus returns to set up his earthly kingdom. So those are the three things Peter pointed out to the crowd and told them. He told them, repent, do a 180, turn around, go back the other direction. When we repent and turn to God, we have a sure and certain hope that a day is coming when Christ returns and, here's a very popular verse, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 4. We've heard that verse many times, and it does give you hope. It does give us hope. Acts 3, 22 through 26. For Moses truly said unto his father, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you and your brethren like unto me. 
Him shall ye hear in all things wheresoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Ye and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in the seed, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, unto you first God, having raised up the, His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away from one of you from His iniquities. He's telling them. Moses is saying, God has a plan. He's sending his son as our Messiah. And if all will accept him, they shall be blessed. But those who haven't, they will not be, he says. They will be shall be destroyed from among the people. We know that Jesus is the only way. We know that Moses talked about that. We know uh, Peter confirmed this when he said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 12. You want to look that one up. It says here, it says, when Moses said here, listen, listen up now. That's what he was saying. Hear this. Listen up. It wasn't just, he used a word, uh, he used the Hebrew word S-H-A-M-A. -A. I'm going to call it Shema. Because I don't, I don't, I've never studied Hebrew and I'm going to call it Shema. Which means more than hearing the words, it includes actions. Have you ever said that before? The author goes in here and says, have you ever said that before as parents? Have you ever said, um, this room needs to be cleaned? And then added with a dramatic pause. Do you hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? We do that. We do that. So Moses was saying, listen up. Listen, I got something important to tell you. I want you to hear this. Stop what you're doing. Put down everything and listen to me, he said. Moses wanted his people to hear his words. Listen to the Messiah and do what he says. Repent and turn to God. His, he's the only one worth listening to. There's great news because he wants us to come to him. He wants to save us. He wants, this, he wants to bless us. But it's through him and only through him. So when Moses was saying, basically sends words to his people, he asked them, basically, in his words, listen, do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? This is going to change your life. This is going to change your eternity. There's great news because he wants us to come to him. He wants to save us. He wants to bless us. But it's through him and only through him. Folks, this is a good lesson today. This is a good reminder. This lets us know where we need to be and what we need to be thinking about. It does give hope. If you've dulled yourself through the years, with it says here, let's go back to the beginning. God created us for God created us for with the dull color of self and the grime of sin. God created us in a perfect way. He, he created us to serve him. But it says here that with the dull color of self and the grime of sin, we have dulled ourselves over our lives. The grime of sin is in our lives. The finish is dull now. But there's hope. There's hope. It's not a DIY project, it says. It says we need to go to the master for restoration. This author 
did a good job in presenting these these verses. He did let us know that he gave us the bad news first, but he followed it up with the good news. And he gave us hope of restoration through the Master, Jesus Christ, and our Lord and Savior. And what a wonderful way we can be. We can repent, we can refresh, and we can restore. Folks, we enjoy Sunday mornings. It's the highlight of our week, and we just hope that you all will keep coming in and join us. Uh, some of y'all are headed off to Sunday school this morning or to the churches of your choices, and I encourage that. Um, just do something today to ask the Lord to help you. Repent, refresh, and restore. Let us pray. We're going to pray one for another. We're going to pray for all the prayer requests that are out there. Dearly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much that you gave us this gift. And we thank you so much that even when we let it dull and the grime of sin gets in, you're not finished with us. You give us that chance to repent, refresh, and to restore. And all that comes only through the Master's touch, and that's you. Dear Lord, there's so many prayer requests out there. There's so many needs, dear Lord. We have prayer requests. We have needs, dear Lord. We just pray that you would answer all those in your time and your will and your glory, dear Lord. Watch over us, lead and direct our words. Watch over us and direct our path that we would be always in the center of your will. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Folks, we hope you've enjoyed the lesson today. And we hope you do something today that will lift you up. Be thankful and count your blessings. Let the Lord know you're thankful for what he's already done. And go ahead and thank him in advance for what he's going to do. You pray for us and we'll pray for you and we'll all get through.